Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Pat O'Brien, Ronald Reagan, Donald Crisp, and Faye Ray in Canute Rockney, All-American. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The tang of coming winter is in the air. The smoke of burning leaves is the perfume of the season. And during the past few weeks... Millions of Americans have made their traditional weekly pilgrimage to the football fields of the nation. Thankful this year, as never before, that such peaceful battles are still theirs for the asking. Every school and college in the land has its gridiron great, heroes of fact more thrilling than fiction. But the greatest of them all was Knut Rockne. His name is a symbol of the American will to win, but win or lose, to play the game the American way. Tonight in Knut Rockne, All-American, you'll hear the true-life drama of the beloved Notre Dame coach, played by Pat O'Brien, who is starring in the same role in Warner Brothers' great screen success. Pat's performance in the picture is earning the combined cheers of screen and football fans. And with him tonight, we have Ronald Reagan and Donald Crisp, also of the picture cast, and Fay Ray. Knut Rockne was a good deal more than just a coach to his players, so there's a good deal more to his story than just football. It's the saga of a hard-driving fighter who made life always exciting, of the woman he loved and the adventures they shared. It's our answer to your many letters requesting this play, letters we're glad to answer. We get a particular thrill out of letters like this one from a lady in Wisdom, Montana, a town of prophetic name. She writes, I want to thank you for giving us such... Grand plays in the Lux Radio Theater every Monday night. We live in the Rocky Mountains, miles from anywhere. And it's a treat for us to hear such wonderful programs. You know, I used to think that Lux flakes were too expensive to use on a ranch, where there are endless dishes and clothes to be washed. But I found I was wrong. They're really economical. Then she proves she's thrifty by adding, I buy Lux flakes by the case, so I'm never without it. Words of wisdom, ladies and gentlemen, from Wisdom, Montana. But now for some action, not Notre Dame. We raise the curtain on Act One of Knut Rockne, All-American, starring Pat O'Brien as Knut Rockne, Faye Ray as Bonnie Rockne, Ronald Reagan as George Gipp, and Donald Crisp as Father Callahan. <laughs> In 1892, Lars Rockne and his family left their home in Voss, Norway. Among millions like themselves, simple, hard-working people from the old countries, they followed the new road of equality and opportunity that led to America. It was in the city of Chicago that Knut Rockne grew up. Like other boys of his age, Knut was often sent to the store. Like other boys, Knut was often hours late in returning. Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock, and still he is not home. Martha, that boy is never here for dinner on time yet. Good evening, Papa. Ah, here he is now, Lars. Knut. Where have you been and what have you been doing? Outside playing the most wonderful game in the world. It's called football. Knut, your nose is bleeding. Is it? Somebody stepped on it. I guess that's part of the game. Tell him, spiel it. Where's Slag spiel as he sent you talking on Asia? Oh, Papa, don't talk Norwegian. Talk American. We're all Americans now. In 1910, Knut Rockney entered Notre Dame. He was older than the other students of his class. He was 25, and his rugged frame showed evidence of the hard years of work he'd put in to earn the money for his education. Those years were not wasted. Knut was a junior in 1913 when Father Callahan, the president of Notre Dame, summoned him to his office. Come in, Rock. Morning, Father Callahan. Father Nolan. Hello, Knut. Here, have a seat. Thank you. Now, just relax, Knut. I've got nothing on you this time. Oh. Canute, you have only one more year to go for your degree. I hope so. You've made a fine record in the past three years. On a man in your class, and next fall you'll be captain of football. That's a very rare combination. Thank you, Father. Dr. Newland here tells me you've got the best brain for a chemistry of any man in his class. <laughs> I guess it must be a pretty dumb class. No. 
You have a definite talent for science, Knut. There's going to be a great future for men like you in the next few years. That's a great compliment coming from you, Father Nolan. Wait until you hear the rest of it. Knut, I want you to help me this summer. Stay here as my assistant, good pay. As you know, I'm trying to perfect the new formula for synthetic rubber, and I need a good man to check my experiment. Well, uh, I don't know just what to say, Father. There must be a hundred men who'd fight for the chance to work with you. Then you'll stay. Well, I'd like to, and I, I appreciate it. You understand, but... Well, you see, Father, Gus Ray and I have just signed up for the summer at Cedar Point to work as lifeguards. Lifeguards? That's no work for a man with your intelligence. You're passing up a great opportunity, Canute. Oh, no, I realize that, Father. Maybe next year... I'm I... not interested in next year. My work won't wait. I picked you out because I thought you had some brain. What did you say? I promised Gus. He promised Gus. Canute, I could make a first-class scientist of you inside of ten years. That's what you were born to be anyway. You big Swede. Who can say for certain what a man was really born to be, Father Newland? That's God's will, not ours. Someday, Canute will find his right place in the world. And whether it be science or not, I have a feeling it would be the one thing he was meant to do. Of course, Canute, I don't suppose you and Dore would be taking a football along to Cedar Point by any chance? Well, we kind of figured we'd... Take it around the beach a little. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm trying to make a chemist out of him. All right, toss it, Gus. Right at you. That's the stuff. How do you say we rest a while, huh? Yeah, it was a nice passing, Gus. Say, Rock. Did you see the Tribune this morning? I haven't seen a newspaper in two weeks. Yeah, if you'd stop mooning around Bonnie Skiles like a lovesick calf, you might learn some news. I'll stop, will you? <laughs> what news? Notre Dame's playing Army this fall. The Army? When? Where? At West Point, November. The paper says they've got the greatest team in history with three All-Americans. We'll get a nice little trip back east, but they'll probably tear us apart. Who said so? Oh, don't be a sap, Rock. The Army allowed weigh us 20 pounds to the man. We couldn't lick him if we took a shotgun along. All right, we'll take a shotgun. Oh, you ought to wear a hat, Rock. This sun's beginning to get you. Listen, Gus, this game means a lot to Notre Dame. It's our first big chance, don't you see that? Yeah, it's big, all right, but so's a freight train. Gus, we're going to beat them. Big as they are, we're going to beat them. <laughs> no, don't laugh. I got an idea. Those eastern teams like the Army are all power, knock you down and run over you like a steamroller. Well, if you can't go around a steamroller, maybe you can go over it. No team has ever used the forward pass as the major threat of its offense. Consequently, no team has had a good defense against it. We're going to pass the Army, Gus. We're going to pass them dizzy. Rock, if it works, it'll make history. All right, let's start them making history. Come on, you're a quarterback. I'm it in. Come on, let's get the hang of it. I'll cut in sharp. Now let me have it. Here she comes, Rock. That's it. It's a beautiful night, isn't it? Yeah, great. We won't have many more like it, Canute. The summer's nearly over. That's right, Bunny. You're going back to Notre Dame next week, and I'm going home, and... Yep. We won't be seeing each other again for a long time. That's right, Bunny. Not a next Christmas vacation... Tell you what I'll do, Bonnie. I'll spend a week with the family in Chicago and the rest of it with you folks. How's that? Well, that'll help. Till June. <laughs> oh, Bonnie, I don't know what we're going to do. What we're going to live on after we're married. You're taking an awful oh, chance. we'll get along. I can cook and sew and you'll get a job. Well, Father Newland seems to think he can make a chemist out of me. They can't be any good at it. You'd be a success at anything you tried, Canute. Bonnie... I know I'm not what you'd call a romantic type. But I'll do everything on earth to make you happy. You know that, don't you? Yes, I know it. There's something else I wanted to tell you tonight, Bonnie. Yes, Knuth? Gus and I have got a great surprise cooked up for the Army. Oh. Bonnie is going to make history. Listen, nobody ever thought of using the forward pass, see? I, I mean, not the way Fort Notre Dame's going to use it, you see? Gus takes the ball from center like this. He fades back like this, and I run down the field. Count ten, and now... Well, what's the matter, Bonnie? Well... Go on, Knut. And uh, now? They... You know, now somebody ought to kick me right square in the seat of the pen. <laughs>
Well, Canute, now that you've graduated with a magna cum laude, what are your plans for the future? Well, I haven't decided yet, Father. I've had a couple of offers, but... What kind of offers? Mm, they're not very definite. To coach football. Is that it? Oh, yes, in a sort of a way. I don't know why I'm dumb enough to offer you another job. Or why I bothered to look for synthetic rubber when you've got a solid head of it. Did you say a job, Father Nolan? Maybe I've changed my mind. Dr. Nolan wants you to stay here at Notre Dame and help him teach chemistry. The job doesn't pay very much to start, but he has great hopes for you later on. I'll take the job and thank you, Father. Good, good. You'll start next term, Canute. Uh, there's uh, just one more thing, Father. You don't have any objection to my sort of helping Harper with the football team this fall, do you? Yes, you're true with football. Get that into your head once and for all. Oh, but I won't take up much time, Father, and the extra money will be a great help to me. You see, I'm planning on getting married. I knew I should have picked a priest. I'll only work with the team until I get on my feet. See, you don't think I'm crazy enough to take up coaching as my life work, do you? Will you hand me that burner, Canute? There you are, Father. We'll finish this last test, then perhaps we get some sleep. That's all right with me. Oh, by the way, the boys tell me you're a good teacher, Canute. They all want to be in your class. Yes, that's what worries me. I get no respect, none at all. You'll have respect someday. All you can ever use if our work here is successful. If we can find the answer. If we can make good rubber cheaply without using gum. A great part of the credit will be yours, Canute. No, you're the quarterback on this team, Father. I'm just the water boy. Always will be. You can be anything you want. I've watched you ever since you came to Notre Dame. Since the first day you ask a question in my class. <laughs> I guess I was pretty much of a nuisance with my questions, wasn't I, Father? Yes. That's how I knew you might make a scientist. And you will, Canute. Believe me, I know. You have the brains and the strength. These first few years are the hardest. Just live simply and keep your chin up. We're going to do great things, you and I. Hello. Father Nolan's lamb, yes. Yes, this is Mr. Rockney speaking. What? When? Where is she? Yes. Sure, uh, I'll be there right away. Canute, what is it? What's happened? It's Pawnee. The baby. It's here. Oh, Bonnie. Connie. Don't yell. I just got Billy to sleep. Oh. You, you want to put this stuff on my hair, Bonnie? What is it now? Creosote. Sit down and keep the towel over your eyes. First it was bear grease. Then something called Old Doc Simpson's Sure Grow Snake Oil. And now it's creosote. I declare you've tried everything on your hair except grass seed. Well, Joe Burns says creosote is the best of all. Well, for telephone poles, maybe. The truth is, you've just worried yourself, half ball. No, I know, but Bonnie, can't you see a little fuzz coming in right there? See, I can feel it right That's there. That's the yeah. fringe on the towel. Oh. Five years of coaching football and track without a single day's vacation. When this head of yours gets to look like a watermelon, you needn't expect any sympathy from me. Maybe I can get some sympathy from these. Well, what are those? Travel booklets, places to go. Pick out one you like. Oh, canoes. Do you mean for us? Sure. Go wherever you say. That one about Florida looks good to me. Oh, all right. Well, I'll go into Chicago tomorrow and do some shopping. Florida. When do we leave? Well, let me see. This is August. Football season starts next month. We can't go right away. Well, then what about after Thanksgiving? No, no, no. I've got to attend a coach's conference in Pittsburgh. Oh, then after Christmas, January. That's the best time in Florida anyway. No, no, not for me, Bonnie. I've got to make a talk to those boys at Mooseheart. Then we've got to settle our schedule for next year. The track team starts work in March. That'll take me into July. And then the football season begins again. I see. Here, you keep these. Next year, turn them in for a new set. All right, come on. Come on, come on, get going in there. What have you boys been doing all summer? Fox trotting? Shift outside the tackle. That's better. Keep working in there. How's it look this year, Rock? Nah, we'll have a pretty fair ball club, I guess. What I'd give my right arm for is a halfback who can carry the mail. A big, fast boy who can run, pass, and kick like... Like, say, Jim Thorpe. 
<laughs> a guy like that would never come to a little school like Notre Dame. Oh, I know. I know. The sort of fellow I'm looking for only comes along maybe once or twice in a coach's lifetime. But I'm still hoping. And if I ever do find a boy like that. Hey, did you see what I saw, coach? Who oh, oh, kicked that ball? 50 yards. Easy. Well, who, who did it? Well, that fellow standing over there. Why isn't he in uniform? Wait a minute. Hey, hey, hey bud. Yeah? Come here a minute. Where are you from? Tell you, Matt. Ever play any football? Some in high school. Baseball's my day. Don't you like football? Not much. Go on in. Get yourself in a uniform. Report to the scrubs. Why? Because I think you might make a football player. I doubt Try it. Try it anyway. All right, if you insist. Wait a minute. Either way, come here. What's your name? Gip. George Gip. What's yours? <laughs> Is he kidding me? <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where's that fellow I sent him for uniform? Well, there he is, coach. That's him laying down over there. Mm-hmm. What's he tired about? Beg your pardon, Kip. I don't mean to disturb your rest. Do we bore you? <laughs> no, I got nothing better to do. Maybe I can fix that for you. Would you like to play? Well, I have been sort of wondering why they gave me this uniform. Get in there with the scrubs, the left half. I haven't learned your signals yet. They'll give you the ball. Just run with it. How far? You won't have to bother about that. Come on. Yes, sir. Say, we're not quitting, are we? No. What's up with you? I don't know. All right, everybody up. Everybody up. All right, hold it, fellas. Boys, this is Mr. George Gipp, freshman from Calumet High School. Mr. Gipp has kindly consented to carry the ball for the scrubs. Just call any play, any at all. They're all the same to him, so it'll be good. Line up, boys. All right, I'll take it. Great news. Eight, 16, 21. 23, nine, eight. Hey, look at that guy. They can't touch him. Go ahead, Gip. Go ahead. Hey, coach, that's the varsity he's walking through. The boy who can carry the mail. That's him. There he goes. He's in the clear, Rock. It's, it's a touchdown. Here's the ball, coach. I guess the boys are just tired. Michigan State, zero. Notre Dame, 23. Nebraska, nine. Notre Dame, 14. Northwestern, seven. Notre Dame, 33. Come in, George. You played a great game today. Thanks. Rock get back yet? He's been phoning me every five minutes. His office is full of newspaper reporters waiting to see you. Oh, Rock can take care of him. You're a strange person, George. You've been playing football for three years. And now when you're the biggest news of any boy in America, you deliberately walk away from all that fame. Why? Oh, I don't know, Bunny. I guess I just don't like people to get too close to me. You know, Knut and I often talk about you, George. We'd like our two boys to grow up and be like you someday. You mean to play football? No, not just that. To have your poise and thoughtfulness and your intelligence. Did uh, did Rock say that? Yes. Yes, he did. He said those qualities are rare in a boy of your age. No. Rock's the rare one, Bonnie, not me. There'll be new fellas coming along year after year. A lot of them much better football players than I ever was. But there'll never be but one Rockney here at Notre Dame or anywhere else. He's given us something they don't teach in school. Something clean and strong inside. Not just courage, but a right way of living that none of us will ever forget. (coughs) Don't tell Rock I said that, Bonnie. He'd think I was an awful sap. Mm. That's funny, (laughs) George. He said the same thing about you. There'll never be but one Gipper. Here or anywhere else. (coughs) I'm going to get you something for that cough. No, I'm all right. It's just a little sore throat, that's all. Don't you argue with me, George Giff. I've taken care of babies and football players for years. <coughs> Hello, Rock. Oh, uh, so this is where you're hiding, huh? What's the matter? Too bashful to drop by and get your picture taken? No, oh, I didn't want to horn in in your party, Rock. They get one of your profile. <laughs> Must be nice to read what a great fellow you are, on Saturdays anyway. I haven't gotten that far. This paper says you're a genius. So, let me see... 
There it is. Read it. Hmm. Any coach can look like a genius when his team has a halfback like the Gipper. <laughs> oh, why, you... <laughs> <coughs> well, they're right, George. They're right. As long as you're in there, I look pretty good. You've made a reputation for me. The team's going to miss you like a right arm next year. I'm going to miss you too, George. Won't quite be the same house without him hanging around, will it, Bonnie? No, no, it won't. Here, George, you take this. Lie down now. Thanks, Bonnie. Wait a minute, what is this? What's going on here? George is a sore throat and a very bad cough. So, let me see. Come over here, the light. Oh, it's nothing serious, Rock. The season's over anyway. Who said anything about the season? Open your mouth. Wide. Mm-hmm. You're all right. Come on, get your hat. Hey, anybody think you were still in the Army? <coughs> I saw enough of the Army to know what's wrong with you. Bonnie, we're going to the hospital. This is a sick boy. How's he doing, Doc? Is he any better? No, Rock. I'm afraid not. Oh, is there any chance at all? Rock, we've done everything we could. You know that. It's no use. How long has he got? I can't say. Perhaps the night, perhaps an hour. I think you'd better go in now. George. Yes, Rock. George, this telegram just came from Walter Camp. You were named as fullback on the All-American team. Me? You wouldn't kid me, Rock. No. No, I wouldn't kid you. I'm on the level. You're going to be all right, fella. I haven't got a complaint in the world. What's tough about this? I'm not afraid. Only rock. Someday, when the team's up against it, things are wrong, and the brakes are beating the boys. Will you ask them to go in there with everything they got and win just one for the Gipper? I don't know where I'll be then, but I'll know it, and I'll be happy. In just a moment, Mr. DeMille returns with Act Two of Knut Rockne All-American... Starring Pat O'Brien, Ronald Reagan, Donald Crisp, and Faye Ray. But before we go on with our play, we'd like you to hear what's going on all over the United States. If you could fly from coast to coast, from Boston to San Francisco, everywhere you went, every day of the week, this is what you'd be likely to hear. Send me a large box of new quick lux, please. Right away, Mrs. Brown. I need some lux flakes. A very big two boxes. Yes, Mrs. Smith. A large size Lux, please. Yes, Mrs. Jones. New quick Lux, please. Yes, Mrs. Blake. Lux, please. Lux, please. Lux, 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 Lux. Well, that's the way it goes. In hundreds of stores all over the country, women keep asking for new quick Lux. American women certainly know what they want. Yes, sir, Mr. Ruick. We want new quick Lux. You certainly do. You've proved it. You've made new quick Lux the most popular soap for nice things in the whole United States. By a vote of two to one. Well, what's so amazing about that? It doesn't surprise me one bit. Well, Sally, isn't it pretty wonderful that twice as many women use Lux for underthings, stockings, and other nice things as use any other flakes, chips, or beads? Yes, ma'am, it's new quick Lux two to one. But I'm not a bit surprised. You know, Mr. Ruick, sometimes I think you men don't give us women credit for having any brains. Of course we choose new quick Lux. Well, think of what it does for us. How much it saves us. First of all, it saves our pretty things. Undies, sheer stockings, fluffy sweaters. Yes. With Lux, they stay lovely looking longer. It's so gentle. Safe for anything safe in water alone. And it saves us time. Because it's faster. In water as cool as your hand, it suds three times as fast as any of ten other leading soaps tested. And it's thrifty. It certainly is. New Quick Lux goes further. Gives more suds, ounce for ounce than any of the ten other soaps tested. That's true even in hard water. Fast, safe, thrifty. 
No wonder New Quick Lux has become the favorite American way to care for nice things. The choice of women all over the United States. And now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of Knut Rockney, All-American. Starring Pat O'Brien as Knut Rockney, Donald Crisp as Father Callahan, and Faye Ray as Bonnie Rockney. Someday, Knut will find his right place in the world. Those were Father Callahan's words. And Knut found that place, not in the laboratory, but on the football field. It was not an easy decision. It was made after long and careful thought, because he felt that his real job was coaching, turning out great teams for Notre Dame, turning out men. All right, everybody up. Everybody up. All right, come on. All right, men, starting a new season today. Got a tough schedule ahead of us. We're used to that at Notre Dame. Now, let's get this straight before we start. I don't want any fellow out here to think he's any better than anyone else. And that goes for you, Letterman, too. Football consists primarily of tackling and blocking. And nobody can make this team if all they can do is carry the ball forward, pass, or punt. Any of you spoiled high school stars who do want to learn to block and tackle, turn in your suits tonight. Turn them in tonight. You can't make the team here. The Notre Dame system is based on teamwork. Teamwork, which means a combination of self-sacrifice, brains, and sweat. And the brains come first. Now, I'll expect you to work hard, but I'll also expect you to maintain a high average in your classes. We want to win if we can, but you didn't come to Notre Dame just to play football. Five years from now, the public will have forgotten even the best of you. Remember that. All right, let's see what you look like as a dummy. Come on, get moving. <laughs> Rutgers, zero. Notre Dame, 48. Carnegie Tech, zero. Notre Dame, 19. That clock says 1.15. Is that right, Doctor? Mm, seems to be 1.15 a.m. on the dot, Mrs. Rockney. Thank you, Professor. It was very nice of you both to come and sit up with me, but I'm sure Canute will be back soon. The last train from Chicago was due ten minutes ago. Well, as members of the Notre Dame faculty, Mrs. Rockney, this is our humble way of helping to celebrate the team's illustrious victory. When I celebrate, I never go to bed before 1.30. <laughs> <laughs> Bonnie! Oh. There he is. Bonnie. Bonnie. I've just seen something. I've got the idea of a lifetime. Canute, what, what, what is it? Doc, Professor... I saw a show in Chicago tonight. Chorus girls, a whole row of them. Canute. Chorus girls? At your age, no, Rock? No, no, I don't mean that. It was the rhythm, like poetry to watch them move. Effortless, beautiful. Those girls gave me an idea for a new kind of a backfield shift. Oh, that's better. <laughs> oh, I tell you, it'll revolutionize the game. No lost motion, no waste of momentum, split second timing. And the public, the public will love it. It's new, it's colorful, it's great showmanship. Here, Doc, let me show you what I mean. Stand over there. Now, listen. Please. Professor, you hold your spot right there, and I'll take the tailback position. Mm. Bonnie, you get in there left half. Me? Come on, we need one more for a backfield. Oh, all right. All right, now, good. <laughs> now, when I yell, hip, everybody takes a step that I hop to the left like this. All right? One, two, step, hip. Swing your arms, get the rhythm. All set, okay, here we go. 25, 36, 51, hip. <laughs> Well, watch it, Doctor. <laughs> Fun, isn't it? All right, try it again. Put some zip in it, Doc. Here we go. 38, 42, 29. Hip! Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. oh, Bonnie, you're away ahead of the ball. Wait for the hip. I was not ahead of the ball. I fell over the coffee table. Oh, uh, all right. We've got four boys coming back next year. Four boys will take to the ship like ducks to water. Once more now. 21, 58, 55. Hip! Hold it, Mike. Hold it. Oh, you're all out of step. Swing your arms wide like this. Get the rhythm. You look like a brakeman flagging a train. Oh, and you, Miller. You know, you've only got two feet. Do they have to step on each other? Well, I... Uh, still, Dory, you're moving too slow. The whole point of the ship is to catch the opponents by surprise off balance. Oh, yes, uh, Crowley. I hope I'm not being too personal, but did you ever learn to dance? Well, uh, I can waltz a little. Yeah, I kind of thought that's what you were doing. <laughs> All right, all right. Now, listen, boys, listen. We've got a great thing in this shift, if we do it right. And I selected you four, you four, because I know you can do it right. 
Made to order for you. I know it's tricky. That's the beauty of it. If it works the way I figure, it'll revolutionize football. All right, let's try it again. All right, Mike, put another nickel slot. Here we go. One, two, three. Hip! After the game tomorrow, we leave for Florida on a nice long vacation. Yes, dear. Just sit on the sand of Miami Beach and do nothing all day long. Absolutely nothing. Yes, dear. All day. Oh, uh, Bonnie, I hope you didn't forget to pack my flannels. I've packed them every fall for 12 years. Even the moths are beginning to lose hope. <laughs> oh, now, Bonnie, that, that's not fair. Who is it? Hiya, Rock. Oh, yeah. What are you doing, Rock? Rock? Come on in, boys. Come on in. Well, what's on your mind? I'd like to get a statement, Rock. What's the dope on the Army game tomorrow? Notre Dame and 13 points. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the cadets are plenty tough this year. They think they can break this 16-game winning streak of Notre Dame. That's what they say. That's right, Coach. Boys, this is off the record. But nobody can stop our team. They said we'd miss the four horsemen. We'd fold up like a bridge table without them. If anything, we're even better. We've been undefeated for three straight years. And tomorrow we'll take the Army into camp just like we took the rest of them. <laughs> Almost unbelievable, but it's true. The powerful Notre Dame team is going down to defeat. Army, 27. Notre Dame, zero. Oh, there's he. Well, I still can't figure why we couldn't wait in New York for a later train. Well, I wanted to slip into town before daylight. The students usually like to come down to the station and welcome the team back, don't they, Canoe? Sure, when we win. For three years, they've met every train. We lost this game. I lost it. Oh, I was too cocky, had a swell head, thought I could outsmart everybody. I don't blame the folks in South Bend, whatever they think of me, because I let them down. Don't take it so to heart, Canoe. There's always next year. Bonnie, I don't even want to get off the train. We'll face him tomorrow. Can't. No, we won't get off, Bonnie. We... Let's go straight on through to Chicago and then down to Florida the way we always planned. Maybe in two or three months they won't feel so badly about it and then I can come home. That's what we'll do. South Bend. South Bend. This is it, Canute. South Bend, Mr. Rockner. Rush officer. Well, Canute. All right, Bonnie. Go and face it. I think that's best. <laughs> Listen. What is it? Well, it sounds like... Come on. Now, wait a minute. Wait. Wait. Maybe your folks didn't understand the newspapers. We didn't win this game. We lost. Who cares? We still got you, Rock. Thanks. Five thirty. My, you shouldn't have stayed up for us, Father. If the rest of Notre Dame can, I guess I can. Father, I, I never had anything like this happen to me before. All those boys down at the station. Didn't you hear what they said? Who cares if we did lose? We've still got you, Rock. And have we still got you, Canute? 
There's been a lot of talk these last few months about large offers to you from different colleges. None of us would blame you if you did leave. Any man must better himself if he can. We've just wondered what you'd do. That's all. How could any man better himself with friends like mine? No, I'll never leave Notre Dame, Father. I'll never leave Notre Dame. Thank you, Canute. Thank you. <laughs> After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille presents Pat O'Brien, Faye Ray, Ronald Reagan, and Donald Crisp in Act Three of Canute Rockney All-American. Ladies, did you ever wash a sweater and have it come out half its original size and all faded and scratchy into the bargain? It's maddening and expensive, isn't it? Why not take a tip from a woman who knows a lot about sweaters and how to care for them? She's a lady from Saskatoon, Canada, and she's written us a very interesting letter. Will you read it, Sally? Mm-hmm. She says, I have a number of sweaters which I received from the old country made of the finest wool. Some of them are three or four years old, but you would never know it by looking at them. Their color hasn't faded one bit, and they're still as soft as when I first got them. Yet I can truthfully say that I've washed them between 40 and 50 times, always in lukewarm Lux suds. Now that's a fine letter. It's not surprising that New Quick Lux is by far the most popular way to care for sweaters. First of all, it's so gentle and mild. And then it's so fast. In water as cool as your hand, an ideal temperature for washing sweaters, New Quick Lux dissolves three times as fast as any of ten other leading soaps tested. Finally, it's thrifty. A little Lux goes a long way. You know, I think you ought to warn women about two things that are very hard on sweaters, Mr. Ruick. Two things that may shrink them badly. Hot water is one, and the other is cake soap rubbing. You're right, Sally. With Lux, you don't need hot water, and there's no rubbing either. So you can see why woolens stay lovely looking longer with Lux care. Oh, now, Sally, how about giving the ladies of our audience the Lux method for washing a sweater? Well, first you draw the outline of your sweater on a piece of heavy paper for a pattern. Then whip up some nice, rich, cool Lux suds and just squeeze them through the sweater. Don't rub. Rinse in water as cool as the suds. Press out the moisture in a Turkish towel. Then lay the sweater flat on your paper pattern and ease it into its original shape. Pin with rust-proof pins and leave it to dry. After it's dry and you've taken the pins out... Press the edges gently with a warm iron over a damp cloth to take the pin marks out. Thanks, Sally. Remember, new Quick Lux is safe for everything safe in water alone. It comes in the same familiar box, and it doesn't cost you a cent more. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. rises on the third act of Knut Rockney, All-American. They still like to talk in football circles of the famous Knut Rockney system, but his success was based on more than system. It was based on patience and good sportsmanship, on a deep understanding of the boys who worked with him. One afternoon before the Navy game, Rockney received a letter from the father of one of these boys. Listen to this, Hunk. Hmm. Now, Rock, I have waited three years to see my son play for Notre Dame. But you've never given him a chance. Unless you dislike the boy personally, why don't you give him a square deal? I promise you he'll tear that Navy line to pieces. Signed, John O'Flaherty, class of 96. Maybe you ought to take a job at Sing Sing, Rock. Then the alumni wouldn't bother you. <laughs> yes. I saw that O'Flaherty boy on the hall. Send him in here. Sure. Hey, Charlie, send O'Flaherty in. Hmm. Here's one from the Moose Hot Orphanage. Dear Canute, me and the other boys up here have been reading all about you and the Notre Dame team. 
We have got a football team, too. Will you let us call ourselves the Rockney Colts? We don't have real uniforms, and we don't know many good plays, but we have got lots of spirit. Then he's got a postscript down there. It says, win that game Saturday. <laughs> Did you want to see me, Coach? Oh, yes. Yes, sit down, Flaherty. I just had a letter from your father. From Dad? What does he want? To sit on the bench with you Saturday? No, he wants me to put you in the game. Oh, but... I'm not even going, am I? No. Your dad's got a lot of pride in you, hasn't he? I guess so. That's a great thing for both of you. Don't ever let anything happen to change it. You know why I'm not taking you to Baltimore? Well, I... I guess it's because I'm just not good enough. No, that's not it. You are good, O'Flaherty. You are good. You're just not big enough, O'Flaherty. I've never played you because I was afraid you'd get hurt. I've kept you on the squad all these years because you ever got spirit. Great spirit. Better than your dad's, if you ask me. Oh, he'll get over it. You know how fathers are. <laughs> I ought to. I'm one myself. Oh, I'd like to put you in there next Saturday. But against that big baby line, you're taking off a beating. You might... Well, you might fumble. Lose the game for us. That'd break your dad's heart, wouldn't it? Yes, sir. If we win, they may forget it. And if we lose, you can blame me for not playing you. Either way, it'll make him happy. What do you say, O'Flaherty? Just thanks. Good boy. See you this afternoon, son. Yes, sir. Uh, Hunk. Yeah, Rock? Add O'Flaherty's name to the list for Baltimore. But Rock, he never goes with the team. I know. He's going with us this time. I'm going to let him kick off. <laughs> Yes, this is Mrs. Rockney. Yes, yes, it is serious. No, I'm sorry. Mr. Rockney can't see anyone. Doctor's orders. Yes, I'll let you know. Now you're crazy, Doc. It's my leg, isn't it? Yeah, sure, it's your leg. But you're my patient, you stubborn Norwegian. And you're a very sick man. The veins of your legs are swollen up like manila ropes. You've got phlebitis and you've got it bad. Ah, I could get up and walk right now. What is phlebitis, Doc? It's an inflammation of the veins. And if you move around, there's a strong possibility of forming a blood clot that would travel up to your heart. What did that do? Well, your insurance company wouldn't like it. I've warned you about this for ten years, but you wouldn't listen. You've let those boys of yours smash into you year after year, knock you down, run over you. Now you're paying for it. You're not 20 years old, you're 42. And if you don't obey my orders, you'll never be any older. No, but, Doc, we're playing the army on Saturday and the boys... I don't care if you're playing the whole schedule on Saturday. You don't move out of that bed. And those are my orders. Bonnie. Bonnie. Yes, Knuth? Bonnie, I want a wheelchair. What? A wheelchair, Bonnie. A wheelchair. We're playing the army on Saturday. It looks like an army day. Score at the end of the half. Army, six. Notre Dame, zero. Rock, fellas. Well, boys, I haven't a thing to say. You played a great game this first half, all of you. I guess we just can't win them all. Boys, I'm going to tell you something I've kept to myself for years. None of you here ever knew George Gipp. It was long before your time. But you all do know what his tradition stands for at Notre Dame. Well, the last thing he said to me was, Rock, sometime when the team is up against it, when things are wrong and the brakes are beating the boys, tell them to go in there with all they've got and win just one for the Gipper. I don't know where I'll be then, Rock, he said. But I'll know about it, and I'll be happy. That's all, boys. Well, what are we waiting for? Come on! Army, six, Notre Dame, seven.
Criminal scandal attacked by noted educators. Cry of professionalism raised by college authorities. Football purge opens in New York. I suppose you've read all this, Rock? I've read every word of it. Noted educators, are they? They've got no argument. The public doesn't believe this stuff. The public believes whatever it reads in the papers, Canute. Unless it is denied in type just as large and preferably larger. The coaches of other colleges all over the country want you to go to New York, Rock. They need your name and voice to speak for them. Will you do it, Rock? All right. I'll go. But I'm not going to mince any words. Mr. Rockney, the original idea upon which all college sport is founded is that a normal amount of exercise is helpful to young men engaged in their studies. Do you agree with this definition? No. As far as it goes, yes. How would you amend that definition? Mm. Games such as football are more than merely helpful to boys. They are an absolute necessity of the nation's best interests. Why, Mr. Ruckney? Because every red-blooded young man in any country is filled with what we might call the natural spirit of combat. In many parts of Europe and elsewhere in the world, this spirit has manifested itself in continuous wars and revolutions. But we have tried to make competitive sports act as a safer outlet for this spirit of combat. And I believe we've succeeded. Do you mean to imply, Mr. Ruckney, that college football, as practiced at Notre Dame, is a form of pacifism? Well, I suppose you could get an argument on that from some of our opponents. <laughs> but that is precisely what I mean. Mr. Rockney, have you ever interceded for a football player who fell behind in his classes and had to be suspended from your team? I have not. If any player flunks in his class, he's no good to the coach or to the school he attends. And the coach who goes around trying to fix it for athletes to be scholastically eligible when mentally they're not, well, he's just a plain everyday fool. Mr. Rockney... Couldn't football be replaced by some other game? Uh, something less violent? What game would you suggest? Well, hockey, for instance. <laughs> well, no, 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 just a minute. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I, I once suggested that very idea to Father Callahan, our president. I explained the game to him in detail, and he seemed downright interested. Until we came to the use of the sticks. Then he held up his hands. No, he said. No, that game is never for this university. Notre Dame will never endorse any game that puts a club in the hands of an Irishman. <laughs> in your opinion, Mr. Rockney, what is college for? Where do these elaborate spectacles of sport fit into the scheme of education? What is their contribution to the national intelligence? Gentlemen, we are living in the 20th century. To limit a college education to books, classrooms, and laboratories is to give to education too narrow a meaning for modern times. Now, if I have learned any one fact in my 20 years of work with boys, it's this. The most dangerous thing in American life today is we're getting soft. Soft inside and out. And we're losing that forceful heritage of mind and body that was once our most precious possession. Now, we... These coaches and I have given our lives to working that flaccid philosophy out of our boys' minds and bodies. We believe the finest work of man is building the character of man. We've tried to build courage and initiative and tolerance and persistence without which the most educated brain in the head of man is not worth very much. Now, our boys at Notre Dame have played all over the country and they've gotten to learn that Southerners aren't lazy. Northerners aren't cold. Middle Westerners aren't hicks. Californians aren't big and dumb. They've found from all sorts of America what America is. And in that process, they found themselves. Now, I don't know, Professor. I, I don't know how you'd grade a boy for learning all these things. 50, 75, 90, perhaps. But wouldn't it be a good idea... Not to grade anyone's contribution to the national intelligence until all the results were in, say, five or ten years after he's graduated, when his record and character aren't hung on the wall like a diploma, but are hung inside the man himself. Oh, Knut, this son is wonderful. And so good for the children. Why, oh, of course, Bonnie. 
Didn't I promise you we'd come to Florida? Yes, dear. Seventeen years ago. Oh, no, seventeen. Couldn't be that long. <laughs> oh, don't worry about it now. Just relax. <laughs> well, Bonnie, I promise you it won't be seventeen years before we're here again. Every winter from now on, we'll take the kids and go south and really get some fun of our life. Well, that's never been much trouble for you. you know, the day we left South Bend, Father Callahan said to me, if Rock ever loses that laugh of his, I hope he doesn't outlive it long. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Rockney? Yeah, something for me, son? Yes, sir. Telegram, sir. Oh, thanks. Here. Thank you, sir. What is it, Knut? Well, I've got to go to California. But not... not right away. Yes. See, I promised those fellas I'd come whenever they needed me. Oh. Oh, there ought to be a union for people who can't say no. You aren't going by plane, are you? Well, Bonnie, if I, if I take a train, it'll take me three days. This way, I'll, I'll get there in no time. I'll be back Monday. But you know how I feel about flying, Rock. Bonnie, I wish you wouldn't look at me like that. Come on now, honey. Help me pack. I'll wire from Kansas City tomorrow morning. When will this telegram reach Florida? Within half an hour, Mr. Rockney. I'll send it right away. They say there may be a storm ahead of you, Rock. Why don't you wait over here till the next plane? Haven't any time to waste. I want to be back in Florida by next Monday. I'm on a vacation. Passengers from Los Angeles plane. Los Angeles plane. That's so long. Soft landing, Rock. Thanks, fella. You mean happy landing, don't you? A transcontinental plane flying from Kansas City to Los Angeles crashed this morning on a hilltop three miles from this town, carrying to instant death the six passengers and two pilots. Among the identified dead is Canute Rockney. We who are here are but a handful of his friends. Come to pay our last tribute of devotion to his mortal remains. Of necessity, we are few in number in this hallowed place, though thousands are without the doors. But we represent millions like ourselves who are here in spirit, listening all over America. Knut Rockney might have gone to any university in the land and been gladly received and forever cherished there. But he chose Our Lady School. He honored her in the monogram which he earned and wore. He honored her in the principles and in the ideals he set up in the lives of young men under his care. He was indeed her true son. Yes, Knut Rockney has gone. And who was he? Ask the President of these United States who dispatched a personal message of tribute to his memory. Ask the King of Norway, who sent a special delegation here to represent him. Ask the thousands of newspaper men whose labor of love in his memory has stirred every heart in America. But above all, ask the men and women from every walk of life. Ask the children, the boys of America. Ask any and all of these. Who was this man whose death has struck a nation with dismay and has everywhere bowed heads in grief? Knut Rockney, born 1888, died 1931. He'll never be forgotten, for his doctrines live on in men he knew as boys. Men who now carry aloft his standard of fair, clean play and sportsmanship. Among them... Rip Miller, Navy, James Crowley, Fordham, Harry Stuhldreher, Wisconsin, Frank Thomas, Alabama, Eddie Anderson and Frank Corridio, Iowa, Charlie Bachman, Michigan State, Noble Kaiser, Mal Elvin, Purdue, Jim Palin, Washington, Buckshaw, Santa Clara, Adam Walsh, Bowden, Gus Doré, Detroit, Clipper Smith, Villanova, Jack Mayer, Auburn, Marty Brill, Loyola, and Elmer Layton, Notre Dame. So we bring to a close our play, tonight's performance of Canute Rockney, All-American. In just a moment, Mr. DeMille will bring our stars back to the microphone. 
But first, it looks to me as though Sally here had something to say, something rather complicated from the way she's figuring with that pencil and paper. Almost an hour a day, seven days a week. What on earth are you doing, Sally? Oh, I'm figuring out how much time a housewife spends washing dishes every year. What's the answer? Oh, wait till I finish figuring. 300 divided by 8, 3, 7. Well, just imagine. Why, well, that'd be eight hours a day for five weeks out of the year. That's a long time to have your hands in dishwater at the mercy of the soap you use. If that soap is harsh, it's bound to make them rough and red and unattractive. No woman wants hands like that. It's much better to use gentle, new, quick lux flakes. Much, much better. And this has been proved by hundreds of women in tests of five leading dishwashing soaps, including Lux. Tests made under conditions similar to home dishwashing. Lux left their hands ever so much softer, smoother than the other soaps did. You can prove this for yourself. Try new quick Lux in your dishpan tomorrow. Ask for the generous big box, the same familiar Lux package. It's fast, it's thrifty, and it's so mild, it helps your hands stay soft and smooth and lovely. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Back in the center of our stage now is Pat O'Brien, the man who made Knut Rockne live for us tonight. And with him are Faye Ray and Donald Crisp. Thank you, C.B. It was a great honor to be chosen to play the part of Knut Rockne on the screen, and then again here in the Lux Radio Theater. I've admired him ever since I was a kid. Pat, you played a little football yourself a few years back, didn't you? Hmm, you've been holding out on us, Pat. There wasn't much to hold out, C.B. Well, now, the way I heard it, you were a star quarterback in Marquette and ran 90 yards for a touchdown against one of Knut Rockney's best teams. That is more than a little exaggerated, <laughs> Fezzi. You mean it wasn't 90 yards, Pat? You can't run 90 yards sitting on the bench. <laughs> I didn't get in late in the game. Coach was, well, he was desperate. He'd used up the first, second, and third string backs. He was finally down to me. I played about 30 seconds, didn't even get my hands on the ball. Outside of that, the story's true, huh? Well, anyway, you can always tell your children that you played against a Canute Rockney team. That's what I said to myself when I tried to get up for the sixth time. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very comforting thought, Pat. By the way, Mr. DeMille, what's your next play? 14, 82, 91. Hey! <laughs> no, 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 not football. Oh. I mean next Monday night. <laughs> Next Monday night. <laughs> well, we've, we've got a play that's a sure winner, Donald. My Favorite Wife, adapted from Leo McCary's RKO picture. Who are the stars going to be, Mr. DeMille? You like them all, Faye. Laurence Olivier, Rosalind Russell, and Gail Patrick. Three of everybody's favorites. My Favorite ri- Wife is a, is a gay mix-up. It was one of the hits of the year on the screen, the story of a lady who returned from being shipwrecked on a lonely island to find her husband married again. It's a situation with great possibilities for Lawrence Olivier, Rosalind Russell, and Gail Patrick next Monday night. And a swell time for the audience, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. If acting were football, you three would be a sink for the Rose Bowl. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Lawrence Olivier, Rosalind Russell, and Gail Patrick in My Favorite Wife. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Third in tonight's play were Griff Barnett as Father Newland, Ted Bliss as Doré, Charles Seal as Doctor, Earl Ross as Chairman of Investigating Committee, Lou Merrill and Arthur Q. Bryan as announcers, Edwin Max as a reporter, James Eagles as O'Flaherty, Fred Shields as a professor, and Harold Daniels, Forrest Taylor, Bob Burleson, Joe Panario, and Celeste Rush. Our play tonight is an adaptation of the Warner Brothers picture, Canute Rockne, All-American, which is currently being shown throughout the country. Ronald Reagan will soon be seen in the Warner Brothers picture, Santa Fe Trail. Donald Crisp is currently appearing in the Warner Brothers picture, City for Conquest, and Fay Ray's forthcoming picture is the Columbia production, Legacy. Our music is directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Roick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>